Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Errol Zeki, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Sassfin Wealth. So on behalf of Sassfin and our panelists, I would like to welcome you to this live webinar. Today's webinar is titled Beyond Global Wealth and Into the Future. Um, this is the same title as the Physical National Roadshow we hosted last year. And um, you know, these are some familiar faces for any of those of you that attended those sessions. Just to reiterate, as before, this is not a COVID-19 talk per se, but obviously given the moment the world is in right now, uh, it is going to dominate much of the content uh, in this series of webinars, not necessarily today, but in general. And then just a reminder to any of those of you that are clients of ours, our business is fully enabled to operate remotely, so please do continue to contact us via the normal telephonic as well as digital channels. On our panel today, firstly, we have Arthur Goldstuck. Arthur is an award-winning writer, analyst, and technology commentator, uh, a winner of Essay's Distinguished Service in ICT Award. Uh, he's the author of 19 books and the editor-in-chief of South Africa's longest-running online consumer technology magazine, uh, Gadget.co.za. He also writes weekly tech trend column in the Sunday Times, as well as weekly consumer technology feature for The Citizen. He is the founder of Worldwide Works, leading groundbreaking market research and presents his insights to audience around the globe. The company won the Business to Business Marketing category at the Sabre Awards 2019 for research on behalf of clients. Um, Arthur also heads up Sassman's uh, Digital Advisory Council, which I'm a part of and which we are very grateful for. Thanks. Then everyone. we have Dale Immerman. Uh, Dale is a technology professional, corporate educator and keynote speaker with 12 years experience in software, financial markets and digital transformation strategy. Uh, he has facilitated tech learning programs for Duke Corporate Education, Henley Business School, and Singularity and University. Dale is the founder of the Mojo Dojo and Catalyst Africa, uh, two companies uni uh, uniting mindset skills, creative thinking, and technology to accelerate practical change in Africa. Uh, Sassfin held a successful robotics immersion with Dale last year, and uh, this was one of these sessions where we invited the children of our clients uh, to attend, uh, together with our CSR flagship, Africa uh, Tikkun. Last but not least, we also have our own, our very own uh, Nicholas Dakin. Nick has worked as a global equity analyst at Sassman in the research team for the past four years. He's also very involved uh, with the investment team in the management of the Sassman Global Equity Fund. Uh, he is particularly interested in analyzing highly innovative and disruptive global uh, companies that are transforming the world. It's a, quite, a, quite a mouthful in terms of those introductions. So Nick will provide an introductory presentation and then lead a discussion with Dale and Arthur for the next, let's say, 30 to 40 minutes. And thereafter, we'll try and answer as many of the questions that are posted to the chat as we can in the time available. Um, so with that, uh, Nick, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. And good afternoon, everyone. It's Sassman's responsibility to determine which companies will succeed and both during and after this pandemic. The key message for everyone listening is that there are plenty of exciting investment opportunities out there for investors to take advantage of, even during this very difficult time. We maintain our belief that companies that have positioned themselves to benefit from long-term investment trends and themes, which are changing the world, should continue to do very well. So what are some of these themes? They are automation and robotics, cloud computing, e-commerce, fintech, online education, work and entertainment, as well as health tech. In today's webinar, we'll only touch on three of these, e-commerce, online entertainment, work and education, as well as health tech. Three of the areas which have probably seen the biggest boost as a result of what is unfolding. While we have to acknowledge that the pandemic is having a devastating impact and has also provided greater momentum and accelerated adoption of many of these themes. And it is important to note that none of these investment themes are new. All of them were taking place prior to the outbreak. As a result, while global equities are still down quite a bit this year, if your portfolio was positioned in these areas, you would have fared much better. In the past week, we have actually seen a number of shares that play into these themes reach new all-time highs despite what is going on. While we won't discuss the automation theme in detail today, Arthur, you mentioned a key point here that's worth touching on. You told me that you view automation as the almost the glue that brings together all of the themes that we are going to discuss today. 
Why do you say this is the case? Nicholas, it's because when you look at all the emerging technologies that are supposed to change the world and some of which are changing the world of business, there's one thing that underpins all of them that is really the foundation for emerging technologies, and that is automation. So in its most uh, common form, we see it in production lines and in robotics, and that traditionally is how we've seen automation. But now it's moved into something called robotic process automation, which is what we typically come across as software bots. And what those allow companies to do is to interact with their customers in an automated way. So very often the customers don't even know that uh, they're dealing with uh, software. But it goes beyond just the customer interface. It's also the back end of businesses and of operations. Uh, when you look at other areas of emerging technology and also sectors that are uh, flourishing, like cloud computing and even gaming, you find that automation is a massive part of allowing them to scale up. So without automation, none of the other emerging technologies could have the massive global impact that, that scaling up requires. So maybe you can tell us how this relates to our first theme today, which is e-commerce. In e-commerce, you uh, see it from quite a few points of view, and probably the most significant underlying trend that I've picked up in the local e-commerce scene is the extent to which the traditional retailers, the grocery retailers in particular, have not been able to scale up their operations because they are so manual intensive. So when you look at Pick and Pay and Woolworths, for example, uh, and you try to order groceries from them, you've got to wait for a slot three or four weeks from now. It's because they cannot scale up their operations. The e-commerce that is going to flourish in uh, the coming years is the e-commerce that is uh, automated and that can scale at the uh, drop of a hat. And we see that, for example, with uh, Take A Lot on uh, Black Friday they were able to scale up to a massive uh, level and they were only let down by their payment providers. The payment providers couldn't scale up. So when you look at <clears throat> what's happening with e-commerce now, you see that people who would never have bought online before are forced to buy uh, groceries. Those people are new e-commerce participants and after the crisis is over, many of them are going to carry on buying online. Some will go back to the old way of doing things Many will prefer the old ways, but suddenly a new generation, you could say, and it's typically an older generation of uh, online shoppers has entered the market and many of them will stay in that market because they've discovered the convenience and the like. But this means that the other retailers who can't take advantage of the current demand for groceries are going to have to step in and meet this new demand that emerges. And they'll only be able to meet that new demand effectively if they automate their processes as effectively as possible. Just for some context, uh, the global e-commerce market is dominated by two regions and two companies. So that is the Char China and the US, as well as Alibaba and Amazon. On its own, China represents around 55% of the global e-commerce market. So this is nearly twice the next five uh, countries combined. Just to give you an idea of the size of, of e uh, China in the e-commerce market. In my mind, um, similar to what you're saying, Arthur, the outbreak has provided that sort of extra push required to get people who hadn't given online shopping um, to do so now. I believe that many of us uh, will still make use of online shopping platforms even once this, this pandemic ends. Dale, if I can bring you in here, many people have been slow to buy online shop, to buy into online shopping because seeing and touching a product is important to them. Can you maybe give us some practical examples of how e-commerce players are using technology to, to overcome this challenge? Sure, thanks, Nick. Um, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, it's a real privilege to get some company and performance insights from yourself as well as industry insights from Arthur. Um, for me, yes, uh, if we look at how, how technology is impacting the everyday consumer who is who's shopping online, I think we're going to see a explosion of digital asset types that are gonna help consumers make purchasing decisions. 
So as you guys mentioned, e-commerce is not slowing down. In the last month and a half, Apple actually released three new products online um, during, during the epidemic, the first being their iPad Pro, um, their flagship laptop, the MacBook Air, and a $400 entry-level iPhone. Um, and if you go to their website, um, you can actually explore these products in 3D by, by spinning them around. But in addition to that, you're able to actually use augmented reality, um, one of these new technologies, to place these products onto your desk and see them like for like as if they were actually there to help you, to help you make a purchase decision. And so e-commerce players are going to have to evolve um, the types of assets that they've been using from low-res photos to high-res photos to videos and close-ups to 3D objects and, and finally now to augmented reality. Um, I was having an interesting discussion with someone the other day um, around the possible revival of televised shopping experiences like QVC um, via social media. Um, so similar to the very mark or the home mark, except for um, high quality big ticket items where people will present and unbox the product, demonstrate it to you, and then using augmented reality, you could potentially put that product down in your home. And so it all starts with companies having digital twins of their products created and then looking for ways for people to engage with them. Um, and so if we unite these ideas, the most significant potential e-commerce play for me actually comes from Facebook in the last few months, where they've recently launched something called augmented reality advert units. And so what this really allows you to do, for example, if you were a sunglasses retailer, you could show an advert for a pair of sunglasses in the user's feed. And when they click on that advert, it would bring up the camera and place those sunglasses on your face as if you were wearing them in a shop in front of a mirror. Furthermore, you'd be able to actually purchase those items without ever leaving the Facebook platform, which gives a, a level of seamlessness that we, we haven't really seen up until now. And so these are some of the things I think we can expect to see in the online shopping game in the near future. I think with you know, everything that we said, uh, it's, it's very little surprise that, that Amazon has just seen a massive surge in demand lately. So after hiring 100,000 extra staff last month just to try and cope with increased demand, it said that last week that it's going to hire 75,000 more. Obviously, Jeff Bezos is, is smiling. Um, as Amazon shares continue to reach new all-time highs. Uh, in the East, we have Alibaba, which is slowly returning to, to business as normal as the, the Chinese economy starts to, to fire up again. And a smaller e-commerce company has been growing very rapidly as, as Shopify. This is uh, directed at the small and, and medium businesses so that they can take their, their businesses online. Uh, Shopify shares are up over 160% over the last year. Um, in our innovation portfolio, we own a company called Bowsen, which can be regarded as the sort of Shopify equivalent in, in Asia. So next we'll move on to online entertainment. So yeah, we are referring to dreaming, gaming, music, uh, social media. And surprisingly, this is one of the themes that has received the biggest boosts in demand. I think many of us are, are spending way too much time in front of our screens. Uh, but Netflix, Facebook, TikTok, uh, House Party, and the so-called uh, stay-at-home stocks are absolutely loving us for it. Arthur, uh, I read your article in the Sunday Times yesterday, which discusses how you know gaming is thriving during this this lockdown. Can you share some of your your insights with us? Certainly, we, we've seen, for example, a company like Activision Blizzard, which I think is on your radar as well. Um, being the makers of Candy Crush, amongst other things, suddenly thriving because, of course, everyone is playing the game on their phones and getting advertising delivered to them and uh, um, expanding the revenue streams for a company that traditionally is uh, supposed to be only a games developer. And you see that across the games industry. There are numerous spin-offs and byproducts of uh, gaming that represent revenue streams, especially at a time when they almost dominate the eyeballs of the public. What we've also seen in the last few weeks is almost in the same breath, three of the world's biggest tech companies, the biggest PC makers and makers of motherboards, 
released gaming computers at almost the same time. So Dell Technologies, Lenovo, and Asus, all three released their new cutting edge next generation gaming computers. These are companies that traditionally would be trying to sell workstations, for example, or uh, computers for the workplace, and they are concentrating heavily on the gaming industry. There's a good reason for that. If you look at what gaming was worth last year, it was a $120 billion industry. It's bigger than music. It's bigger than the movies. And in fact, it is almost absorbing the movie and the music uh, industries at the moment. There's a Polish company that makes a game called Witcher that has been turned into a Netflix series. And when you look at the explode, explosion of gaming and of home entertainment, uh, streaming entertainment, you can see why a company like that suddenly is the most valuable listed company in Poland. Um, last week, they reached a value of $8 billion, surpassing the second biggest company in Poland, which is a bank that has a market cap of only $6 billion. You're seeing that across the board. Uh, every gaming company you look at, their share prices are simply exploding. And uh, a lot of them still have room to run. Some perhaps have been overdone. If you look at Nintendo, for example, it's way above its previous highs. And that's a question of whether you like the business or have an appetite for it. But you can look at gaming, you can look at streaming, look at Netflix, uh, for example, which briefly crashed earlier this year. But when you consider a crash, a Netflix crash was from 150 billion market capitalization to 120 billion dollars. And that was overdone because it was based on a knee-jerk reaction to them losing a small proportion of their customers in the U.S. when they put up their subscription rates. But when you look at the benefit they got from that increased subscription rate, the increased uh, dollar income, it far outweighed the loss of those customers. So people who are selling Netflix at that stage were making a massive mistake. And that's been shown in the midst of the lockdown with Netflix also thriving. Yes. Um, I think it's also very important to, to mention that the gaming industry is a very early adopter. So, Dale, have you played any of these games? And can you tell us about the technology that is actually being used to power them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm not a gamer, but something I wanted to just bring up first, which I thought was fantastic, was the One World Together at Home concert. I'm not sure if any of you saw that. It was a concert to celebrate healthcare workers uh, organized by Global Citizen and the World Health Organization, but really curated and spearheaded by Lady Gaga, who assembled hundreds of artists from around the world. I just, I just thought that was absolutely fantastic and gives us a glimpse into the future of entertainment. In terms of gaming, um, I'm not a gamer, but I have played and, and could potentially admit that I'm slightly hooked to a game called PUBG Mobile. Um, which is a first-person shooter, and the, the goal is to be the last team standing out of 100 people. It's very similar to Fortnite, which is owned 40% by Tencent, um, as well as Call of Duty from Activision. Um, and these are no ordinary games like Snake or Tetris or, or even Candy Crush. They, they're very advanced technological games, and so they use high-resolution 3D graphics, which make them almost photoreal. Um, they use spatial audio, which creates a level of immersion that we've never experienced before. Um, within them, they have uh, audio conferencing so that you can engage with your team. And so they're very social games as well. And they incorporate e-commerce. Um, people are using real money to buy vanity items within these games. And it's one of the ways that they're generating a lot of revenue. And of course, they're leveraging cloud computing. Um, Tencent, for example, who have a stake in PUBG, have actually installed the local servers in South Africa. And from a gamer's perspective, it improves the experience of the gameplay by reducing sort of a 300 millisecond delay to a 20 millisecond delay when you're actually playing these games. And so for me, it's also quite interesting how these are some of the same technologies that organizations now are having to converge in order to have effective remote working experiences for their staff and their clients. If I could also mention, uh, Dale, you're playing PUBG, and a lot of people there are discovering PUBG through their mobile devices, particularly in South Africa. So Tencent, in fact, um, assigned the head of innovation for Africa to bring PUBG into Africa, and they've launched a version of PUBG Mobile called PUBG Mobile Lite, which is specific 
for emerging markets where connectivity isn't the greatest. So by having a light version, they're able to get even deeper penetration into markets that previously wouldn't have been open to uh, gaming companies. And that level of focus on both innovation and market expansion tells you why Tencent is so big in uh, the gaming market, aside from the numerous other areas in which uh, they're, huge, they're huge. So we can expect uh, Tencent to keep pushing the boundaries of uh, not just innovation, but also business strategy in terms of business expansion. So it's a company definitely to watch. Absolutely. I think just, just to wrap up on, on this theme, from Sassman's perspective, uh, Walt Disney remains one of our, our preferred stocks in the entertainment space. While the theme parks and studios uh, businesses have obviously been hammered, um, the company's relatively new Disney Plus streaming service has been a bright spot. So they uh, announced last week that the service has already reached 55 million subscribers. Uh, they were only expected to reach this number by 2022. So very good adoption of, of Disney Plus. They launched in India last week, which is the key market for them. And they already have over 8 million subscribers there. Next, we move on to online work and, and education. So for those of us that are able to work from home, technology and the ability to work online has been absolutely invaluable at this time. Zoom is the one that's been grabbing all the headlines. Uh, so it's seen its daily users jump from 10 million to over 200 million users in just three months. Uh, obviously, Microsoft's Office products have, have never been more important to us uh, during this time. Dell, you're particularly passionate about education and, and culture. What are you seeing in the learning and remote space currently? Great. Well, um, from my side, it's, it's been interesting. What, what I've seen circulating in terms of content or content trickling to the top has really been a focus around the mindset and the soft skills that people need in order to work and learn from home. Um, uh, you know, as, as someone who, who follows technology closely, it's funny to me because the, the tools that we're being almost forced to use right now have, have mostly been around for longer than a decade. And so why have we lacked the inclination to, to use it up until now? Um, but now that we see the mainstream making use of these tools, there's a really big opportunity for companies to, tri to, stre to stress test their solutions. So, for example, with Zoom seeing this massive influx of users, um, it revealed a lot of security flaws in their system and they had to halt some much-awaited enhancements to address these flaws, which ultimately make the product um, a lot better. And so I think we're going to see the improvement of a lot of these products that are new to many, but have been around for a long time. And, and that's going to sort of further, further the, their adoption. Um, I don't believe that there's a silver bullet solving the variety of work from home challenges that people have, um, other than to really just be resourceful and get on with whatever the outcome of your job is. Um, but in terms of schools, um, we're seeing them and teachers and students and parents communicating and engaging more effectively and transparently. Um, you know, I'm friends with a lot of teachers and this idea of blended learning, I think, has been quite frustrating for many. And so I'm interested to see how, the, how schools are going to start advancing the content um, that they start using to engage with, with students, much like the e-commerce players are having to do. At a university level, um, most are coming online if they haven't been online already. And for me, what's really exciting is I feel that for the first time, we're seeing a, a possible genuine democratization of education as we know it. Um, mm. Another area um, in terms of working is a space that interests me is culture and, and human resources. And how, how are they going to potentially adapt to, to the need to hire and fire people without ever having have met them in person. Um, so, I mean, overall, I, I think what's exciting for me in, in the tech realm is that new hardware and new software combined is enabling new ways of learning that is more immersive, uh, it's questionably more effective, and, and I think for, for now it's more relevant than people have ever had before. If I can just uh, jump in there, Nicholas, I want to endorse what Dale said about there not being a silver bullet for uh, working from home and for uh, remote education. 
we in the midst of a research project for Cisco where we're looking at remote working strategies and we just had first sight of the early data from this research without giving too much away at uh, this stage. What I can share is almost exactly what Dale says, that there isn't a silver bullet. There's no one solution that everyone is embracing. It's a combination of tools that uh, seems to be the approach for most uh, businesses. But one of the really interesting things there, and this is significant from, the, from an investment point of view, is the extent to which Microsoft products keep coming up. So Teams is very common, Skype is very common, and then a combination of the two, Microsoft's um, Teams and Skype, which they own, of course, uh, is a regular occurrence in uh, the data that we see. And that is something that I think the savvy investor is going to pick up mm -hmm. on as well. Everyone look, is looking at the Amazon uh, share price, which is surging because Amazon right now is dominating e-commerce, largely through growth in sales in North America and uh, Western Europe. But they're also running out of uh, stock. They're having to invest heavily in additional uh, staffing. That's going to cost them massively. So the cost base of what they're doing is massive. The extent to which their share price has outrun its uh, previous highs compared to Microsoft, which is still not back to the high it reached in early uh, February, gives us the um, indication or the clue rather that uh, Microsoft is actually a great opportunity right now. If they really are a company that is dominating the tools that are being used to address remote working and education. Um, and, and there's actually, there's many more as well. I mean, obviously, uh, Microsoft's the one that we are most familiar with, but there's a lot of companies also that, that are benefiting, um, relatively smaller, but growing rapidly. So you've got companies like Atlassian, uh, Slack Technologies. So Atlassian is a software company that focuses on making collaboration and teamwork with a, within a company easier. Uh, Trello is probably their most well-known tool, which is used to, to manage projects. Um, and then on the, on the online education side of things, uh, 2U and Chegg are, are two companies that have benefited. Uh, 2U is probably best known for its, its Get Smarter platform that offers short courses from universities around the world, uh, UCT included. Uh, you may have probably seen uh, the, the annoying advert that keeps on popping up all the time on your, on your Facebook newsfeed. Uh, so lastly, we, we have health tech. Uh, just also some background on this. Um, an aging population remains the key driver of this theme. So just on this, global life expectancy has continued rising and is expected to reach 77 years by 2050. And this is up from 70 years in 2015. And I think that the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic has certainly just emphasized the need now for the right care at the right time. And because of this, healthcare providers should be much more willing to make use of you know, live diagnostic data in order to minimize and avoid health issues. And this just indicates why data, yeah. now more so than ever before, uh, is off, is, it can actually be regarded almost as, as one of the most important global commodities. Big tech has been getting involved in a, in a big way yeah, as the pandemic unfolds. So, we saw Apple and Google uh, are building a coronavirus tracking platform into their operating systems. And then this will allow health authorities uh, to trace who a person uh, with COVID-19 has come into contact with. Uh, Google also um, has its uh, Verily screening service, which is offering drive-through COVID-19 testing in the US. And I think all of this points to the trend of the doctor's consultancy becoming more virtual. So Arthur, how do you think uh, the move to this sort of virtual consultation world, if I can call it that, will change the, the future of public medicine? We are already seeing it happening, Nicholas. When you consider that uh, Discovery in particular is encouraging its uh, customers to, uh, to have virtual consultations with their doctors, either telephonic or uh, via a teleconference, and uh, in the last two weeks, we had Vodacom announcing that they would work with Discovery to sponsor 10,000 virtual consultancies. In other words, people 
who either don't have a medical aid or can't afford to go to the doctor will be able to get a free consultation with a doctor. This opens quite a few new avenues as well. As with e-commerce, where people who never used it before or weren't fans of it have now found themselves embracing it, you're going to find the same with doctors especially. The holdout in terms of telemedicine and virtual consultations wasn't the patient so much as the doctor who didn't want to embrace new uh, technology. We saw it in South Africa when Discovery issued doctors with iPads to engage with them on their e-health, uh, electronic health platform, that so many of the doctors either put those iPads in their bottom drawer or passed it on to one of their kids. Now, suddenly, they're having to embrace this technology, and they're realizing that it's actually in their interest. It makes them more efficient, they're able to see a lot more patients in uh, less time, and it also decreases their risk of exposure to infected patients. So suddenly it's a win-win for uh, everybody. But that, of course, doesn't get around the uh, obstacle of uh, physical, physically testing or checking up on the patient and getting their vital statistics. And that's where wearable technology comes into the picture. You uh, made an astute observation earlier, Nicholas, about how important data has become. And data is going to be at the heart of uh, virtual medicine and telemedicine in the future. The wearable that the patient has collecting data about their vital statistics is going to plug in to the consultation with a doctor. We're going to have to see new platforms emerge and we should watch closely who are the leaders in uh, terms of developing software platforms that assist in uh, virtual medicine. And there I'm talking about ordinary daily uh, doctors' consultant consultations, not the high-tech mm. robotic surgery and the like, which is also proceeding mm. apace. But for the ordinary individual and on a mass basis, we're going to see a transformation in how data and these tools are going to be used by doctors and their patients. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've liked the wearable space for, for quite some time now. Um, so, Dale, maybe you can just tell us what you believe will sort of be the, the next kind of development in the, in the wearable space. Great. Um, so I think, you know, leading on from what Arthur was saying, I, th I think your, your health data is going to become more important to more people beyond just yourself. Um, and I, I believe that we're headed towards what I call a contactless future. I don't believe it's coming in, in, the, in the next few months or, or couple of years, but I think we're going to start seeing a shift towards that um, where people won't want to make unnecessary contact with, with surfaces um, out of fear of illness. And, you know, if we look at something like 9-11, um, after that incident, there was a big trade-off. We were willing to accept invasive security checks for peace of mind when we travel. Uh, or if we look at the water crisis we had in Cape Town, it created a change of behavior which had a lasting effect. And so I think quarantine and, and, and sort of staying at home is, is going to change the way we, we, we react to things. I think that we can expect a rise of sensors and automation of the data that they provide to eliminate the need to touch things. And so think about things like elevators, um, tap faucets, door handles. These are all things people are very wary of touching at the moment. Um, there's a local business um, called Stop and Pull who have, who have very quickly taken the opportunity to create a small device that you attach to the bottom of your door so that you can open a door that opens inwards. Um, but the real problem here is that, you know, architectural firms are going to need to start thinking about how they design um, buildings. Um, for instance, bathroom doors all open inwards, which from a hygiene perspective doesn't really make much sense. Um, so... The second thing is, you know, will we be sharing our health data more broadly? So much like Discovery um, rewards us with vitality points for exercises that are, are tracked using our health data from our wearables, could our employers stipulate that employees wear devices to track their health? And so, for example, we could have a scenario that if your wearable um, determines that you have a fever, you, you simply won't gain access into the building with your access card and it will be sort of a social contract potentially. But I think that the tech is going to affect all areas of our day-to-day -day 
um, in terms of sensors and software interfaces. We're going to see a rise in, in technology interfaces like voice control and the advancement of things like Google Home and Alexa and Siri. I think we're going to see a, a further rise and explosion in object and facial recognition and particularly how, how we use our faces and objects to control devices. And lastly, an, an area which is, is, is fairly newer and, and touches back onto virtual reality and augmented reality is gest, gesture-based interfaces. How, how do we control something with our hands without touching it? Um, you know, the most primitive version of that would be these um, small sensors that we have at, at many exit doors where you hold your hand up and, and it senses that your hand's there and it unlocks the door. But, but I think these uh, interfaces are all going to be, become very, very advanced very, very quickly. So just to wrap up on, on the health tech, uh, two companies that we, are, we still like um, and have in our global portfolio that, that play into this theme are, are Royal Philips and Medtronic. Uh, Royal Philips actually reported results this morning and it was pleasing to see that, you know, with what we've talked about, the, the connected care and diagnostics divisions uh, actually held up pretty well considering what's going on. So the, the shares up quite nicely today. Uh, and Medtronic... Um, is, is one of the world's largest medical technology companies. So, you know, they've got 40 million, uh, uh, sorry, 40 medical devices that are, that are, that are used to treat various conditions. Um, and they uh, served over 75 million patients last year. So a massive player in, in the space. So just in closing, I think it, it's very important to add that in addition to taking adv in advantage of the themes that we've talked about today, we also believe that your share portfolio should continue to favor bigger companies that entered the crisis with solid balance sheets. These companies are more likely to emerge stronger. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that bigger companies are likely to benefit more from the central bank support measures that have been announced recently. And secondly, Companies with strong balance sheets are in a position to take market share from weaker rivals that now exit or don't have the cash required to continue innovating. Balance sheet strength is especially important in industries that have been particularly hard hit by the outbreak, such as your apparel retailers, airlines, uh, energy stocks, and, and other travel-related industries. An example of an apparel retailer that we are still comfortable with in our global portfolio because of its balance sheet strength is, is Zara owner Inditex. So they still have plenty cash uh, available, uh, meaning that they can last for over 120 weeks without making a single sale versus H&M, which can only last for around 20 weeks, for example. Of course, we have to mention big tech here again. Um, you know, Microsoft and Alphabet uh, sitting with over $100 billion in cash, Apple at just under $100 billion. Um, while this would have raised a red flag in terms of anti-competitive behavior, because I think what you are going to see now is that these big tech companies are going to take over some of the, the startups. I think that the issue of, of antitrust regulation uh, should fall further into the background because uh, the virus should be uh, you know, taking up a lot of attention uh, for some time. But all in all, we still like the, the big tech companies for these reasons. So that's it from me. Uh, lastly, I just hope that, that today's discussion has eased some of your concerns and, and gotten you a lot more excited about some of the, the opportunities out there um, because there certainly still are plenty of them. Arthur and Dale, is there maybe anything that you would just like to add before we move on to some questions from the attendees? No, I think I think the uh, points you make about companies with um, uh, cash on hand is uh, very important, and that's where the likes of uh, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Amazon are especially strong. So those who have got massive uh, cash reserves and uh, are seeing their their businesses flourish at the moment clearly are uh, hitting all the right uh, buttons at the moment. Just a word of warning about Alphabet at the moment is that most of their revenue comes from advertising. And at the moment, we're seeing quite a slump in search advertising in particular because retailers tend to advertise heavily in uh, search engines or for search advertising 
to get people to come into store or to convert them into uh, customers in store. And that entire market for now has vanished. So it'll be interesting to see, but I suspect we'll see a slump in earnings from Alphabet, certainly for uh, the current uh, quarter and possibly the next uh, quarter. But then when people uh, return, when the crisis is over, we hope not too far into the future, we'll see massive pent-up demand and there's going to be massive uh, spikes in, in advertising to try to attract all of uh, those consumers back to specific stores. Okay, uh, Errol, back to you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, um, for those insightful thoughts. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming through. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to direct the question to the person who I think can answer it best, but please, you know, if, if, if you feel you want to uh, contribute or, or pass the question on to somebody else, please do so. So... Um, the, the first one, Arthur, I think is really going to be for you. So there were two sort of related questions. The one being, how difficult is it for a mid-sized retailer to automate the e-coms? Uh, um, it sounds impossibly expensive. And the other one was, what do you think companies like Pick and Pay and the like require to scale up to have the ability to deliver within um, a day or two? So, so two related questions, but one talking to mid-sized, one talking to maybe sort of, sort of a, bigger, a bigger market. But I guess the, the, the theme here really being, for existing bricks and mortar retailers, how difficult is it for them to um, create the ability to scale up? I'm going to give a typically glib answer uh, to that question by saying that it's far more expensive for them not to uh, automate and not to scale up than it is for them to actually scale up and uh, automate. And a great example is Edcon, which as we know, is um, possibly not going to reopen after a lockdown is over. Uh, depending on current negotiations. But they made their mistake not uh, this year or last year or in the last five years, but 15 years ago when they chose to embark on a process of store expansion rather than investing in uh, online um, sales services and general e-commerce infrastructure. The result was that they were caught flat-footed by the rise of e-commerce They've never been able to uh, get a foothold in that market. And at the same time, and possibly because of uh, this, they've been closing stores um, at a rapid pace because of uh, the excessive cost that that has brought into their services. And they haven't been able to replace the sales from those stores in, uh, in the online space. And uh, that's an example for uh, most re uh, retailers to look at. And in this coming decade, e-commerce can become that much more important. So any retailer that does survive at the current crisis and wants to survive into the future and possibly survive future crises as well, because there will be future crises, it's imperative for them to understand how to scale up from a point of view of e-commerce and online shopping. In terms of uh, automation of their services, they have to automate because you can't service a large customer base if you don't automate. If you insist on keeping everything manual, then you're constraining your ability not just to grow, but also to become more cost effective in your operations. The second question with regard to physical retailers uh, scaling up. We have seen part of the solution during the current crisis where Pick and Pay has, has uh, partnered with small players like Bottles, for example, which used to source uh, alcohol and deliver it to their customers. With alcohol sales being banned at the moment, there was a, a natural uh, fit for them to take up the slack in uh, pick and pay's demand and start actually servicing pick and pay's customers who urgently uh, needed a product. So that's the um, early answer or the initial answer for large retailers is to partner with smaller players. And Take A Lot is a good example because um, their e-commerce platform is actually a partnership with numerous smaller players. So where they themselves can't uh, meet the demand or supply certain products, their uh, smaller partners uh, provide uh, those. And then they facilitate the fulfillment. But uh, Pick and Pay also needs to look at the fulfillment model of uh, Take A Lot, where they bought Mr. Delivery to give themselves the ability to fulfill same day 
at low cost. And that's the real challenge for pick and pay and Woolworths in particular. If I can elaborate for a moment, uh, the big challenge with grocery sales and fulfillment is that you have to maintain something called a cold chain, which means that products that were in freezers or fridges have to remain refrigerated until they arrive at the customer. And for that, you need specific kinds of delivery vehicles. And that's the biggest constraint for uh, grocery sales. But there are models for um, increasing the uh, scale um, and the scope of those kind of services globally. You only have to look at what Amazon is doing and try to deploy a scaled down version of the Amazon model. Thanks, Arthur. We, we had a few related questions coming through. Um, some of them talking to, look, obviously, uh, there's a wide use of online uh, buying at the moment, especially for, for, for consumables. But, you know, the question being posed around substitution, not being able to get exactly what you want. Is, is there an expectation that this trend will accelerate online shopping of consumables into the future? Or, or do we go back to the status quo once, uh, once everything settles down? We'll never go back to the status quo. The uh, public has had a taste of online shopping and they won't be able to go back to shopping as usual. Um, even if they want to, they're going to find that the uh, retailers themselves will have refined their offerings and a lot of uh, products that you would normally have bought in uh, stores are going to be offered mainly online. Stores themselves are probably going to shift their uh, product mixes based on what comes out of the crisis. When people go back to not the old normal, but the new normal, and they change the uh, consumer behavior in general. We don't know yet how that's going to play out, but it's becoming fairly obvious that uh, the consumer is going to be a different animal after the crisis is over. Thank you, Arthur. Um, Nick, I think I'm gonna move on to you. We have some company specific questions here. Um, the one talk, uh, asking, uh, don't you worry about Disney's outlook for the rest of the year, a large portion of the business requires crowds in one place, uh, such as Disney theme parks. It is something that you addressed earlier. And there's just a follow on there talking about Disney Plus. It's part of uh, Disney, uh, which has closed their theme parks. So really, you know, we're talking about the, the same question. Uh, do you mind just addressing that again? Yeah, I think um, we have to acknowledge that uh, the theme parks and studio side of the business, um, you know, that that is the big profit contributor to to Disney. Uh, Disney Plus is still loss making, so that's that's not making money yet. Obviously, it's still in the investment stages. So Disney Plus is is not going to offset, you know, the the decline that we're going to see in these in these much bigger parts of, of Disney, but. We still think that uh, content is key and Disney has the content. So, um, for example, Netflix, on the other hand, they don't have the library of content, uh, which, which Disney has. So this requires them to continually put, um, you know, massive amounts of money back into the business. So, you know, you're talking $15 billion a year on content. So I think... That's the, that's the key reason why we, we still like Disney. I think that there, there is going to be a lot of pent-up demand once this all ends. I think that people are going to want to get out there and, you know, people that were planning to, you know, take a trip to, to Disneyland or Disney World or go to the cinema to watch a, to watch a movie, I think that we, we, we're going to see a very quick bounce back uh, once this ends, uh, with people merely, you know, really just want to get out there and actually do something, and that they, you know, they haven't been able able to do. So, yeah, I think Disney is is in for a very tough time. You know, I would I would almost recommend don't don't look at their results uh, for the next two three quarters uh, because they are going to be horrible. Uh, but obviously, we we're trying to look past that, um, and 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 so far. You know, we're still hopeful that it's going to be temporary and, you know, people will come back. Um, they might not come back at the same, you know, magnitude that they did that they did before because of increased health concerns. But uh, but hopefully, you know, hopefully that it's it, that isn't so, you know, the case uh, too much. Uh, Nick, maybe just a follow up question on, on that. Um, so, I mean, there, there are lots of streaming services out there uh, uh, across a whole bunch of content. 
But, you know, the, the likes of Disney Plus, we're talking about a lot of original content there. How important is it going forward to have original content? Is there going to be space for pure streaming businesses that, that do not generate um, original content? And I think maybe I'll open that up to, to everybody. Uh, I think that original content is, is important. Um, if we look at, you know, kind of all the awards shows um, that, that come up, uh, you know, Netflix has been dominating there. They, they've been doing really well. Um, and, and that speaks to, you know, the original content uh, and, and the spend that they're putting into producing these new shows. Uh, you know, the, the budget, the budget is, is massive. And, and also, it's, it's expensive for the streaming providers to, to buy old content. Um, you know, Netflix and, and HBO and Disney and Hulu have spent, you know, for some, for some series, they've spent hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so both original content and old content is, is expensive nonetheless. And, and, and that speaks to another point why we do like um, you know, Disney from the perspective that they don't have to kind of recreate a, a whole library. Um, but, but it's, it's also, yeah, it, it's expensive to, to kind of get old content still. If I can also mention that, that uh, multi-choice in particular is investing heavily in original content specifically to ward off the Netflix uh, challenge. I think they said that this year they would produce 52 original shows for broadcast across Africa. And that is because they know that Netflix is going to have a similar or even bigger production schedule. But the difference is that their content will be geared towards the audiences across Africa where Netflix's content is primarily global. But Netflix also having um, started producing South African uh, content and in countries like Kenya and Nigeria, uh, multi-choice understands that they have to invest heavily in original content and locally geared content in order to compete with the likes of Netflix. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Um, Dan, I think this one is probably for you. I've seen a few questions coming through on education, specifically education in, in Africa um, and some of the trends and, and changes that, that, that we're seeing at the moment. Can you maybe expand on the future of education and, 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 and edutech, I think it's called, um, and, you know, is there sort of any application for South Africa and, and, and Africa in terms of what's, what's going on now? Absolutely. Um, I saw a number of questions as well, um, also relating to augmented reality and virtual reality, which I think virtual reality is quite a while away from becoming mainstream purely because the the infrastructure required to to use it uh, very expensive headsets very expensive computers um, high speed internet connectivity is just not accessible especially to people across Africa augmented reality however I think um, has a very very big um, opportunity and, and a role to play in education across Africa in the coming years the reason I say this is because Firstly, we're, we're seeing great smartphone penetration, which means that everybody has a device in their hands that is able to view augmented reality content. We are seeing um, the efficient design of augmented reality assets, which means that the download file sizes are becoming much smaller. And we've seen the release of a lot of free tools that have become available from big players like Google and Apple and Microsoft that allow anyone really to create experiences in augmented reality. Apple, for example, has a, a tool that they released recently called Reality Composer. And anybody without writing a single line of code can create a very basic augmented reality experience within an hour on, on their iPhone or on their iPad. And so you don't even require a computer now to, to develop. And, and what's interesting there is we're seeing these, these new augmented reality gestures and interfaces being used to actually create augmented reality experiences. Uh, no longer powerful computers are, are required. But um, I think at the end of the day, you know, education really is around transferring knowledge and, and information to, to and from and amongst people. 
And so across Africa, there is a huge contingent of people who don't have smartphones and who are, are still sitting on, say, feature phones. And um, you're, you're obviously not going to get yourself an, an MBA or, or, or a degree through, through a device like that necessarily. But I think education in its basic form around sharing information um, is going to increase as connectivity increases, as the device penetration to smartphones increases. Um, and it's a very exciting space. Um, one area that I, I think it's maybe not related purely to Africa is, is the, the merging of physical toys with digital surroundings using augmented reality. Um, and so I saw a very interesting demonstration that was done by Lego recently where it's a small augmented, re well, it's a small wind tunnel or a fan and when you point your device at it, it creates a wind tunnel and you can actually visualize the wind. And what you do is you take a Lego model toy car that you've built and you place it down and the wind actually moves around that object to show how aerodynamic it is. Um, and so this is sort of the convergence of object recognition and augmented reality and physical toys coming together. Um, another example I saw is a remote controlled augmented reality car and so you don't physically have the toy but you can wheel spin all around your house and next time you come and open the app to play with your virtual car all the skid marks that you left around your house are still there from the last time um, you were racing your vehicle and so I think uh, toys are going to start playing a, a vital role in, in how children are educated around technology concepts which I think are really the fundamental concepts a lot of people need to understand in order to harness education going forward. Thank you very much, Del. I, I think you know, we're coming up on an hour, so um, I think we'll just squeeze in one last question. And Arthur, I think this might be a question for you, asking about the future of cryptocurrencies in, in, in e-commerce. Um, would you expand on that? I've been speaking to a lot of the cryptocurrency uh, thought leaders, including uh, the person who actually oversees the evolution of one of the main cryptocurrencies, called Monero, and also the people behind Luna, which is South Africa's biggest cryptocurrency exchange. And there's a consensus that cryptocurrency isn't really for transactional prime time. In other words, it's not an ideal vehicle for general transactions. To use it for e-commerce would almost be silly because the fluctuations are so heavy and people are speculating in its value rather than using it as the tool that it was originally devised uh, to be. So the, the person who bought the first pizza with, um, uh, with Bitcoins, I think it cost six Bitcoins, probably has never ceased to regret that uh, particular transaction because the Bitcoin was worth a few cents um, at the time. But um, the consensus generally is that it's going to take much of this decade for it to become truly mainstream and for the speculative aspect of it to uh, diminish and for the transactional use and the utility of it to start emerging fully. What we're likely to see happen long before that, though, is that blockchain will be used as an authentication mechanism for numerous um, other activities, particularly contracts and uh, validating contracts, but also validating the proven provenance of components of products and of uh, resources. That's already happening to some extent. If you uh, look at what Oracle are doing in particular across the world, working among other with Volvo to um, validate the provenance of uh, products being used in their uh, vehicles, it's a fascinating case study in how it not only addresses the a primary intention, which is a validation of, uh, of transactions and of, of activities, but it's also geared towards ensuring that there's less uh, human rights abuse in terms of how raw materials are sourced. So we're seeing great case studies emerging around uh, cryptocurrency, but we're not seeing a great reason for using it for pure financial transactions, and we won't for much of this decade. Thank you very much, Arthur. I think um, we've had quite a few questions coming through. Unfortunately, we, we are out of time. I've tried to group them as, as, as best I, I can, um, but we will endeavor to, 
put something together, maybe answering some more of the questions or summarizing some of the, the issues from the session. So thank you very much, Arthur, Dale, and Nick, uh, for your insights today and uh, all of you for joining us.